Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. I'm joined today by Joe Bartosi, the NSSF's CEO. Well, June is National Safety Month. We like to say safety is never out of season. At NSSF, a lot of us here are hunters uh, and shooters. There's nothing, nothing better than being out in the field. Uh, it's just it's just a great way to spend time and, and to enjoy with your family and friends. The industry was behind the instant background checks since, since its inception. We mm-hmm. we were the ones that recommended that. That's the first line of defense, guns getting into the wrong hands. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's regulations for hunting, but there's also unwritten rules. Respecting the game, respecting the hunt, respecting the landowner, respecting the land itself. I mean, there's all these things that we try to focus on. Great resources, great videos, great programs. And it's all free. It's really something that we're very, very proud of, um, being able to present this to the, to the general public. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and I'm joined today by Joe Bartosi, the NSSF's CEO. And this is a first for me, Joe. I have not done a remote podcast yet uh, for my podcast. We typically film in person, uh, but I was so excited to talk about what the NSSF is doing um, in the promotion of safe firearms use. And in June this month, uh, where NSSF is really devoting to keeping families safe across America, I really wanted to share this message. And thank you so much for taking your time to share this with the country as well. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Christy. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, while, while June is National Safety Month, we like to say safety is never out of season. Uh, but it's a good opportunity for us to remind folks about the importance and, and the responsibility for not only safe firearm storage when they're not being used, but also hunting safely, hunting ethically mm-hmm. uh, and getting out and enjoying the shooting sports uh, in a safe and responsible manner. Yeah, the NSSF really is leading the industry in whole in part of keeping guns out of the wrong hands. That's one big um, focus of yours. But you guys also have a huge focus on encouraging the safe enjoyment of shooting sports and hunting. And I love that NSSF embraces the hunting culture as much as I do as well. Yeah, I mean, our our motto, if you will, our mission statement is to promote, protect, and preserve hunting in the shooting sports. So we we try to treat equally. Uh, you know, look at NSF. A lot of us here are, are hunters uh, and shooters, and we really try to make sure we give a you know, fair representation to both to both elements. Um, and uh, again, there's nothing nothing better than being out in the field. Uh, it's just it's just a great way to spend time and and to enjoy with your family and friends. So let's talk about some of the tools that NSSF has created that are helping to keep families safe. Now, you guys um, have a lot of programs. You know, you've worked with law enforcement agencies. You guys are distributing free cable locks for families for storing firearms. Um, You guys are doing a ton of stuff in that capacity. Can you kind of give everybody a little bit of a background on some of the initiatives that the NSSF has taken to keep firearms uh, safely stored in, in, in hands that are of safe and responsible people that are supposed to be, you know, those firearms are intended for their use. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And I, I tell people all the time, they wouldn't believe that a trade association who is responsible for the firearm industry spends as much time, effort, and money keeping guns out of the wrong hands. Yeah. And I mean wrong, meaning people who are prohibited by law or people who simply aren't experienced or knowledgeable enough to, to be trusted with a firearm unsupervised. We spend an awful lot of time with, with in these programs and we collectively refer to them as our real solutions for safer communities programs. And we've got, uh, that's an umbrella for various programs. For example, the, probably the most well-known one uh, to this point is Project Child Safe. Yeah. That's been going on since 1999. And basically it's about educating people on the secure storage of firearms when they're not being used. To date, we've given out over 40 million firearm safety kits, which include a gun lock. 
but we get hundreds of thousands of visitors to our website each year to download our resources, our videos, our checklists, our quizzes, our parents' guide to secure storage. I mean, we have all these resources at projectchildsafe.org uh, that people are taking advantage of out aside from even the lock giveaway. So that's a really important <laughs> program. But we have other programs too, like our, our work with the Veterans Administration and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention uh, on preventing suicide by firearm. Uh, and we talk about, again, identifying warning signs, having brave conversations with the people that might be having some difficulties, but also, again, tying back to secure storage when farms aren't being used. We work with the ATF on Don't Lie for the Other Guy, which is an anti-straw purchasing program we have throughout the country, as mm -hmm. well as Operation Secure Store to remind folks to keep their, their gun shops, their retail places safe from burglaries or robberies by hardening their facilities. And then, of course, we have a program called Fix Nix, where we've actually changed the law in 16 states, and we had law signed uh, by President Trump to prevent to make sure that uh, disqualifying records are going into the background check system. And since we put that program in place, background records have gone in, increased by 270 percent. So we're very proud of the fact that we're making sure that if you're doing background checks, they're going to be good, meaningful, and with complete data. So these are programs that we actively work on uh, to make sure we have a great future in the shooting sports and for hunting. And I think that's a, the Fix Nix program is, I think there's a lot of people that don't really understand how important the, um, uh, the information transport of that system is to be uh, accurate and up to date. And it's, it's a, you know, that is the, the Nix system is the national instant background check system that when you go to acquire a firearm and they, you know, they basically run your background check. We all fill out the same forms. Um, that system is what, you know, tells the agencies that are doing the research, um, any mental health issues you have, any criminal convictions, anything that would prevent you from being a lawful firearm owner um, as it relates to your constitutional right to, to have a firearm. And without that system being updated and kept up to date and with current information, it's not as effective. So it's not as effective of keeping firearms out of the hands of criminals. And so that's what we really want to do is ensure that we have law abiding citizens that are armed for whatever reason, whether it be for personal protection, for hunting, for shooting sports, whatever reason they choose, but also preventing those people that we don't want to have firearms or don't lawfully have the capacity to own those firearms because of, you know, criminal activity or otherwise. Um, and, and so that NIC system and preventing uh, the wrong people from having those firearms, having that NIC system updated constantly is it's a tremendous amount of work and it's a huge undertaking. And we don't want those people that can't pass that background check to have a firearm. And your guys's work is really helping keep our community safer with that uh, completely. Yeah, for sure. It, it's a very important program. And again, you know, the industry was behind the instant background checks since, since its inception. We mm -hmm. we were the ones that recommended that, and the FBI has been a good partner in making sure the system stays up to date and, and working well. But if we don't have good records in the system, we can't trust that our retailers can do a complete yeah. background check. And that's the first line of defense against the wrong, you know, guns getting into the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the wrong hands, you know, and that that goes back into how project Except, how project child safe is so important because the wrong hands can be, you know, a person in your family, um a young child, um, you know, a teenager, anybody in your family that's really not supposed to be handling that firearm and um, the way that we're teaching people through the NSF's programs uh, to safely store your firearms. Um, can you walk everybody through some of like the key components that you guys are really trying to practice with the Project Child Safe program? It really, you know, we, we really focus on education. Uh, we want to make sure that people understand the responsibilities as gun owners to, to securely store their firearms when they're not being used. And I, and I have trained and taught people of all ages to, to shoot and to handle firearms. Um, but I always tell them when we're done, unloaded and locked. Uh, because that's the only way to ensure that someone who may be prohibited or may be going through a rough patch in their life mm -hmm. or may be inexperienced with regard to farms, that's the best way to ensure that they're not going to be injured. And, you know, we're gratified in the last 20, about 24 years, um, fatal accidents involving farms have dropped by about 40%. So while, while it won't be all the credit of Project Child Safe, certainly 
we are the largest, most comprehensive program in the world on this on this topic. So you know, I'm really gratified to see that our our time and our effort has gone, you know, to really saving lives and mm -hmm. reducing accidents by a significant degree. But also we talk about preventing the criminal misuse of firearms and also suicides by mm -hmm. just being aware of options for storing your firearms. And there's not one size fits all. I understand that completely. Um, but what we ask people to do is to assess their circumstances and make the best decision for them. There's a, a wide variety of options, cost and, and features that everyone can use uh, securely uh, and also to have that balance between access and uh, unaccessible to children or others. And the acronym SAFE, that has meaning. And the SAFE actually stands for uh, the S is for store your firearms responsibly when you're not when not in use, which you touched on. The A for safe stands for always practice firearm safety. F stands for focus on your responsibilities as a firearms owner. And the E is education is key to preventing accidents. And I really think, you know, NRA has programs like Eddie Eagle and, mm -hmm. and other programs um, to help kind of teach kids what to do if they come across a firearm that's not safely stored. And, you know, what we're trying to really do is prevent those types of encounters from happening in the first place. Yeah, that's correct. That, that is a very important thing um, is, to, is to get that out. There's a lot of great programs out there. Um, we, we like to think that, you know, we've, we've kind of hit on something that is not intrusive, but it provides information, education and training mm -hmm. to people that might need it. You know, in the last mm -hmm. three years, there are about 18 million first time gun owners in this country. Mm -hmm. That's a staggering number. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen, consequently, the request for our resources go up dramatically. And we're gratified to see that people recognize, hey, you know what? I'm a new first time gun owner. Um, I want to learn more about how to handle a firearm safely, how to secure my firearm when I'm not being when I'm not using it. And therefore, visits to our website, requests for our locks and safety kits have gone up dramatically. And that's a great thing. We're happy to be mm -hmm. part of that part of that process. And for those parents and um, people that are listening also, you guys have also launched the Hunt Safe program that aims at the promotion of secure firearm storage when you're not hunting. So um, that is a whole initiative that you guys have. You have online resources. Parents can take a pledge where they can make a commitment to safely storing their firearms. Um, and then there's online modules. Can you talk about what that website you know, is designed to, to help parents with? Yeah, the Hunt Safe program and the website and the information is really great. I mean, certainly we tell people the hunt is not over until mm -hmm. you've unloaded and securely stored your firearms, right? Just as a, as a constant reminder about the importance of this thing. But we also have their um, Guide to Ethical Hunting, which really yeah. talks about the, the written, of course, there's regulations for hunting, but there's also unwritten rules, the ethical mm -hmm. rules of respecting the game, respecting the hunt, respecting the landowner, respecting the land itself. I mean, there's all these things that we try to focus on. Uh, we also have checklists uh, and quizzes that parents and young hunters can go on and take to learn more about um, safe hunting, uh, the Hunt Safe program. And mm -hmm. again, great resources, great videos, great programs, and it's all free. Uh, and it's, it's, really, it's really something that we're very, very proud of um, being able to present this to the, to the general public. Yeah, you guys are really putting out so many programs that are offering real solutions that are backed by the firearms industry at keeping families safer. And I know, you know, for me, when I come home from the range, um, you know, I always want to make sure that my firearms are, are secure. Um, but a lot of it's transportation, too. You know, there's so many, like you said, new gun owners that don't understand, you know, when you walk up to a range setting, you know, you should have your firearm um, in an open the action should be open. Your magazines should be out. People should be able to visually inspect the condition of your firearm without actually touching it. You know, always keeping your firearm pointed in a safe direction. You know, people, you know, a lot, you know, some novice uh, gun owners might not maybe have as much muzzle control or safety when their firearms unloaded, you get a little complacent. We like to really, really preach and teach, treat every firearm as if it were loaded. And, um, 
you know, moving that firearm from your vehicle to a range or from a vehicle into a hunting location, that's a really critical time. That's when a negligent discharge or an accidental discharge can take place. So making sure, you know, if you're hunting, your bolt is open, your magazine's out when you're transporting in and out of a vehicle or putting it in and out of a case. Um, have your friend or work on that buddy system where your friend offers a section, second visual inspection, actually putting your pinky into the into the barrel of the firearm and ensure that it is actually unloaded. And all of these things might seem a little repetitious, uh, but you can't be too safe when we're hunting, especially when we have firearms and children um, or young adults or novice uh, firearms owners around that we really always go ahead and set that uh, great example. Yeah, you make a great point there, Christy. Thank you for pointing that out. I mean, NSSF has a terrific YouTube channel where we have literally hundreds of videos on things like range etiquette, safety uh, at the range, and, and things like you mentioned, you know, in a vehicle, for example, transporting mm -hmm. a farm in a vehicle. We learned from ATF that the number one source of stolen guns is from vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole module on how to safely secure your farm in your vehicle mm -hmm. uh, when you're moving from place to place, from home to the range or from, you know, from the hunting fields to your home or whatever. So we, we make sure that that's a very important part of what we stress is that, yeah, it, I mean, it's from the minute you, you open up that safe or gun locker, unlock that gun to the minute you get back to that safe, there's all these steps and all these things you have to be thinking about. And we try to mm -hmm. remind people of all these things by vis video assets, but also checklists uh, and uh, infographics, we call them. Mm -hmm. So we, we put a lot of effort into this. And again, to make sure people are safe and responsibly enjoying the, the sports that we love uh, so much. And when it comes to transporting firearms, there's so many state by state regulations. I mean, in some states, you can have your firearm magazine in, in your vehicle, which you know, I'm not advocating for necessarily. However, there are some states that you can't have your firearm even in your vehicle. It has to be locked. And so really, I think knowing what your state regulations are and then knowing where your family is on your safety factor. And that's kind of sometimes a personal decision as well on how you carry your firearm or how you transport your firearm. Um, we encourage everybody to follow the laws, but also go those extra steps, even if it's not a law, even if it's not required. You know, when you have a firearm in your vehicle, um, in some states like Colorado, when you're in an ATV, the magazine has to be out of your firearm, your bolt has to be open, um, and your actually your firearm has to be in a soft case completely enclosed on an ATV and that is just to really help prevent any accidents or um, uh, other situations that you might encounter with a firearm on an ATV and I like to encourage people to use those same steps when they're driving as well you know magazines out your bolt open keep your firearm in a soft case if you don't have a hard case available um, I've gone an extra step personally because I travel so much with firearms I actually have a truck vault in my vehicle that I can lock my firearms, keeping my firearm and my ammunition in separate compartments um, and traveling that way. It keeps me state compliant in most of the places that I visit. Yeah, there are a lot of really great uh, products on the market today that to do just that, right? Uh, whether it be the truck vault or there's other, there's other um, small lockable portable safes for handguns, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I look, you're, you're exactly right. People have to be aware of their state laws. They do vary from place to place. And if you cross a border, um, mm -hmm. even inadvertently, uh, you could be in trouble if, if you're not, you know, responsibly storing that farm while you're in the vehicle. So yeah, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. out there. Uh, I certainly encourage everyone to learn as much as they possibly can and, and to do the right thing. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, it's all about safety. It's all about mm -hmm. making sure that there won't be an accident. There won't be any regrets. Uh, and you know, cause let's face it, we in the industry and we as hunters and shooters, every time there is a criminal misuse of a firearm or a poaching incident, that puts a black eye on all of us. Absolutely. And we don't want that. You know, we love we love what we do. We love the sport. We love the outdoors. And anytime something bad happens, it reflects poorly on us personally mm -hmm. as well as professionally. So we try to encourage people to please, you know, do the right thing. Be advised. Be aware. There's plenty of resources online uh, now that, that didn't exist when I was coming up as a young hunter and shooter. So... Um, Really, there's plenty of opportunity to, to learn and to be educated properly. 
So in addition to safety resources, NSSF has created the Plus One Initiative, which is aimed at encouraging people um, that are firearms owners or hunters to take someone shooting or also take them hunting. And this is a great program that, I mean, obviously we're trying to grow uh, law-abiding citizens and encourage them to own firearms and, you know, take up the enjoyment of them because they're a lot of fun. No matter where you pursue the wild, never leave home without Onyx Hunt. Onyx gives hunters the confidence to apply and draw tags in areas they've never set foot in, extending hunting seasons and opportunities. Always know where you stand with public and private land layers, unit boundaries, and more. Onyx can even be downloaded directly to your phone for use when you don't have service. Wherever you pursue the wild, hunt with Onyx. Now, I love the Plus One program. Um, you know, we have been really hitting this hard the last few years, and we received well over a million pledges. And basically, it's a mentoring program. So let me I'll back up a step. It's basically saying, look, if every hunter or shooter took just one new new person to the range or to the field, can you imagine what the future of the shooting sports and hunting would be? Um, so we're asking people to take that pledge, to sign mm -hmm. up online on our social media platforms, take the pledge, and take somebody out to the range, take them out mm -hmm. shooting for the first time, teach them safe uh, and responsible handling and use of firearms, and then see where it goes. I, I've taken so many first timers to the range over the years, and almost always they will go out and buy a gun and get involved in the shooting sports themselves. They become avid mm -hmm. hunters or shooters, and it's so gratifying to see that. So we've, we've really taken this to the next level with our pledge program, um, and we're partnering with other organizations out there to help m amplify that message. And um, again, it's a, it's a great program that's very, very important in terms of recruiting new hunters and shooters. It's interesting because I, I attended Gunsight earlier this spring and there were some ladies at this event that were, um, were hunters and were firearms owners. But a lot of the ladies had, you know, perhaps they'd been hunting and shot rifles, but they'd never shot a pistol before. And some of the women were were very intimidated, very nervous. And what I really loved about Gunsight in, in actually getting training, and I encourage everybody to get training, um, is they made you feel safe, they made you feel comfortable, and they took things in very small steps from dry fire practice um, to actually going into live fire, you know, one round at a time live fire, and then slowly building on that confidence. And there were some women that were were first time pistol shooters that were in tears. Um, they went from being very scared to very empowered at the end of I did that. Or some ladies that were um, having some fundamental errors and they weren't quite hitting the target where they wanted to. But by the end of the day, they were hitting the target perfectly. And um just that transformation for them, realizing that a firearm is not anything to be scared of. It's to be respected, but you don't have to be afraid of your firearms. Uh, firearms are, you know, they're an object and they only do what you manipulate them to do. And uh, the the overcoming process that I watched many of these women go through, it literally transformed their lives and they realized these guns are fun. They're fun to shoot. And they're fun. It's a fun sport that I can participate with my friends safely. And um, I just think that this plus one program, even if it's somebody that is, you know, comes from a hunting background or comes from a gun ownership background, taking someone out and mentoring them, perhaps it's something that they've never done. And you never even realize that your neighbor hasn't done that before. And, and it's really a, a powerful tool. Yeah, I mean, look, um, the fir any any first time gun owner is going to be intimidated to some degree mm -hmm. because you know there's there's power right Absolutely. that firearm represents a certain degree of power but with the proper training mm -hmm. the proper approach to the training mm -hmm. the trainer can demystify that experience mm -hmm. and make the user male or female understand that hey you you are responsible you are in control if you follow these rules you're gonna you're, you're gonna be fine and i've seen this transformation occur mm -hmm. in my own family uh where people get the uh, you know go out to the range for the first time and and before you know it they when they break that first clay target or they hit the bullseye or whatever all of a sudden the light switch goes on and they realize oh yeah okay this is not so scary this is mm -hmm. something i can do and it's frankly empowering 
-hmm. for people uh, to, to learn that skill. So, yeah, but again, it's all about the proper training, the proper approach. I mean, I, I would not expect, you know, someone to walk in, you know, first time shooter to walk into a, to a gun shop and rent a, a full size 1911. Yeah. That might be a little much for, for a, new, a new shooter. But there are ways to approach the training um, that make it less intimidating, much more comfortable, and again, demystifying the whole process. So, yeah, that's great. Great to hear that. And with the local VOR movement we're all seeing in the country of people wanting to eat cleaner, more organic, that it is drawing a lot of attention from people that are like, hey, maybe I should try hunting. Maybe I should take up hunting. And there's a lot of people that have uh, sensitivities to uh, domestically raised um, animal products, whether it be beef or chicken or um, or even farm-raised fish, uh, that want to go with a more organic uh food source. And that's why hunting is so important. Um, I, I did a program with some kids that were um, from single parent households. And these kids, um, you know, either the mother or father wasn't, was either you know not present. Uh, some were passed away, some were incarcerated. And we took these little kids doe hunting and um, they had all gone through hunter safety and, you know, understood how to handle a firearm safely. And when they harvested a dough, we taught them how to process and clean the dough. And they took that meat home to their either mother or father and they provided for their family. And I can tell you um, the enrichment that those kids received from that experience was life changing. Um, the, the look on their faces when they were so, these kids were so proud to tell their family, I harvested this and knowing that they're going to be consuming um, meals based off of their bounty. It, it was one of the most remarkable programs I've ever seen. And, and you know, this plus one initiative really um, just solidifies the importance of, you know, how generational hunting and shooting sports really are. And we have to, um, we have to get more people out there and, and participating and understanding that. And um, you guys have actually created a brochure that um, kind of walks maybe new hunters through how hunting got started, how it's important to our ethos and how it's important to our culture going forward. And, and people can find that brochure online. Um, is that on a part of your hunt safe uh in your hunt safe website area as well yes it is if you go to projectchildsafe.org and then you scroll down you'll find the hunt safe initiative and mm -hmm. in there is the ethical hunting brochure uh which is again it starts really from the the earliest days of you know hunting goes back as well as long as man right have been around they've been hunting and we talk about the the ethical obligations again not just to the game and and sometimes the most important shot is the one you don't take That's because right. too far to ethically harvest the animal or you don't know your backstop, you know, what's beyond the animal. There's, there's all these considerations. Um, so, so we try to, we try to humanize that and remind people, Hey, it's okay not to take the shot if you're not sure, because you don't, you can't recall that shot. Once it's out there, it's, it's gone and, and you don't want to, you know, inflict harm or, or injury on the animal and then not be able to harvest it. Or God forbid, there's, there's a person somewhere in the distance that you don't see. So we really remind people to do that. But yeah, projectchildsafe.org in the hunt safe section is all these resources and videos uh, that, that really stress this. And I want to get back to, you talked about the field to fork movement. That is, that has been a big boost to the plus one movement, because I, as you said, every generation, we, we become more removed from our food source. Mm -hmm. We, we lose, we lose the respect of, you know, what, you know, whether it's, whether you're eating a hamburger at McDonald's, there's there's an animal at the end of this chain somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we need to respect that. We need to remember mm -hmm. that. And by harvesting your own food, it's very emotional. It's it's but it's 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 also reminds you of the importance of all the ecosystem and all of nature that you're a part of. So so yeah, great point on that. I think that's very important for people to remember uh about the the food chain in general. Well, and I think, you know, the the thing that, that most of the country doesn't realize is conservation efforts are spearheaded by gun owners. And Pittman Robertson Act um, was an act that that hunters and conservationists, hunter conservationists, enacted in the 30s. Um, and so this program has been around for nearly 100 years. Um, I, I, that's crazy to say that. Uh, so we're over 90 years now um, into, into the Pittman Robertson Act. And it really does the lion's share of conservation work across the country. So 
And for those people out there that don't understand what PR dollars are, is the firearms manufacturers, ammunition manufacturers, um, pay a self-imposed excise tax, and that fund goes into the federal government's ability to do conservation work throughout the country. Um, and so anybody that owns a firearm or buys ammunition is contributing to that act. And it really is spearheading um, the transformation, uh, ecological sustainability of our country and improved habitats for everybody from wildlife conservation principles to, you know, habitat stewardship programs. And, and that is where the funding is coming from, is from the lawful gun owner. And that's, I think, something that we don't hear enough of is the good that guns are doing um, for, for our entire world. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the industry, firearm and ammunition industry, put in, in the last two years alone, more than $2 billion to this fund. And that money gets distributed out to the states um, for habitat restoration, uh, wildlife restoration, fish programs. But but a lot of it goes to the what would we call game animals, uh, you know, basically pr protecting this species. Like if you look back 100 years ago, there were far fewer deer, far fewer mm -hmm. turkeys, far fewer eagles. Um, mm -hmm. that, and all of these animals, whether it be game or non-game species, are protected and, and um, basically cultivated by these dollars going in every year to these PR mm -hmm. from this PR fund. So whether you're a hunter or a shooter or not, you benefit from this program. And we on the on the gun side and the ammo side, we're really proud of this. We're really proud mm -hmm. of the fact that we're able to support wildlife uh, restoration, habitat restoration, and things like that. So uh, it's a great program. People need to learn more about that because even if you just shoot handguns and never hunt with them, you're still promoting wildlife restoration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and conservation so it, it's a great it's a great cycle it's the, it's the envy of the world frankly the mm -hmm. north american model is the envy of the world uh and i can't imagine where we'd be without it yeah our our wildlife is better our wild places are better because of gun owners and and everybody that owns a firearm and buys ammunition can be very proud of that um hunters double down on that when they buy a hunting license and tag um the funds that are generated from that um literally create 75% of those statewide conservation budgets. So uh, hunting license and tag sales is a critical component um, of conservation efforts that are are basically funded, like I said, 75% from those tag sales. So hunting truly is conservation. It's really what is fueling uh, wildlife resources and stewardship of those resources. Um, and, you know, we even triple down on that by a lot of us are members of different nonprofits um, that are uh, dedicated to helping restore habitat and wildlife, um, increase wildlife numbers. Um, you have lots of organizations like Safari Club International, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Sheep Foundation, uh, Mule Deer Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. But we're really, truly, you know, gun owners and hunters are so philanthropic. We love wild places. We love the wildlife that inhabit those wild places. And and we really are doing the lion's share of work to ensure that whether you hunt or own a gun or not, every time you lace up your hiking boots and you head into a wild place, that um, that has been made better by a gun owner and a hunter. Yeah, that, that is absolutely for sure. That's a, that's a fact. And you're right. It doesn't get the press that it deserves, but it is an, it is an absolute success story. It is something that that we all can be very very proud of because we are we are improving the wildlife again whether you whether you're a hunter or shooter or not you're benefiting from from what the taxes were paid by these manufacturers uh, and going back into these states so it is a crucial thing doesn't get as much attention as it should but but we know we know and it's a success story well and i and i wish that that we had a a megaphone that we could tell the world exactly um, what guns are doing. You know, my husband's European and um, the amount of people that own firearms in other countries is, is much less significant than the United States. Um, and I don't think it's amplified globally the good that guns do to the capacity that we could be doing that. And really patting ourselves on the back is something that we need to be doing a little bit more often. You know, not only is the industry as a whole uh, working with NSSF um, to keep guns in the right hands of the law-abiding citizen to keep families safe. But you guys are also the backbone of conservation efforts. And um, 
and, and fueling the most successful model of conservation that the world has ever seen. And um, that's something that I think we can all tip our hat to and, and be grateful for. And, and you guys are working really hard to ensure that we have the next generation of hunter and firearm owner that likes to take up shooting sports. Um, or like I said, even for personal protection so that we can have improved resources and the funding to improve those resources for generations to come. Yeah, it's also encouraging now. We're starting to see a movement among the states where they're actually hiring what we call R3 coordinators. That's recruitment, retention, reactivation mm -hmm. of under shooters. So states are actually, with the dollars, the PR dollars that are coming in, are actually able to hire people whose job it is to don't go into the R3 space, mm -hmm. bring in, uh, you know, maybe retired or, or inactive shooters and hunters, get them out to the range, get them out to the field. Uh, so we're very proud to work with organizations that are promoting this thing. And I get to work, you know, I'm happy I get to work with state directors and mm -hmm. R3 coordinators all over the country. And uh, so I at least can bring the message of the firearm community mm -hmm. to these folks uh, to make them understand where the funding comes from. And it's it's actually taken, taken root now and starting to progress quite a bit. I, I just, my husband and I just completed getting Hunter Ed certified as instructors. And the need for Hunter Ed instructors is so heavy. Um, I encourage everybody out there that's listening or watching um, that if you have it in your heart to once or twice a year lead a Hunter Ed course, please go through the process, become a Hunter Ed instructor. Um, and, and courses can no longer be taught one on one. Um, one adult to students. And most of these courses are taught as a team. Uh, for example, here in Wyoming, we have a minimum of two instructors, but a lot of the classes I'm teaching, I'll come in and teach, you know, one or two components of a three-day or four-day curriculum. And it's kind of co-taught by a team and we really need to grow on that team. And so I want to encourage everybody out there that's watching and listening you know, do yourself a favor, become a hunter at instructor, become a mentor. There's some, some really great programs out there. Um, you know, you have the IHEA program, NRA has free hunter ed. Um, so there's a couple great resources. IHEA has just launched their Hunters Connect program, which kind of has some informational videos. The NSSF has a ton of informational videos out there. And then there's some really great organizations that I've become familiar with, like um, First Hunt Foundation, which has mentors in almost all 50 states now, which those mentors now are saying, hey, we're going to help people come and come out, have their first hunting experience, and you don't have to be a kid. It's anybody of any age. And um, NSSF is just doing so much with this plus one in working with all of these, these entities to really try to create a vibrant hunting and shooting sports community. And I would also make a push for uh, more female instructors. I think, I think mm -hmm. what you're doing is awesome because, you know, if, again, we talked about the intimidation factor. We talk about, you know, the maybe being intimidated or uncomfortable uh, first time out in the field. I mean, having more female instructors is a great thing. Having more instructors of color is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, we're seeing dramatic increases in African-American participation in hunting and the shooting sports, Latino, Asian-American, Female certainly is mm -hmm. fully a third of all first time gun buyers. Uh, so and these are going to represent future hunters as well. So mm -hmm. having having new students relate to their instructors um, and, and being able to be more comfortable in, in that environment. I think we need to get more females and more people of color in these in these roles. So uh, I appreciate what you're doing. It's, it's very, very important. And hopefully your audience will, you know, will will step up to the, you know, the challenge that you've, you've issued and and consider very strongly becoming uh, educators and instructors. Well, and if anybody wants to learn more, go to NSSF's website and look up Google the Plus One program. And there's going to be resources in there and, you know, things that are going to help inspire you uh, to become a mentor in your own community. And that's really, you know, you have, I have a lot of people that will approach me and say, well, how do I start? Where do I start? And you start in your own community. That's where you start. And, and you make a difference in even one life um, because you can change someone's world with one positive trip to the gun range or uh, one positive hunting experience. And I know um, Doug Koenig, um, he's our Ruger shooting team captain. I shoot for Ruger. Doug shoots for Ruger. He's done a lot of videos for NSSF. And um, 
it, it's interesting, like his his story of how he started shooting. I think he was like a late high schooler, you know, young, ad, you know, mid, older adolescent kind of deal. And he went to a, a pistol competition and got hooked because one person in his family took him to the range. And now he's a world class shooter. And so that one time you take someone can really uh, significantly impact their life and change their life in, in a manner. I mean, this man is his, I mean, he's winning Bianca cups and, and he's, you know, shooting long range precision rifle matches and, and is just, his whole life has been redefined by shooting sports and it can take just that one simple little thing, um, that really does change the scope of your world. Absolutely. And, you know, learning to handle firearms safely and responsibly there's a there's a there's a discipline there there's there is something that is empowering there's something that is um inspiring and mm -hmm. educational and it, it, you know it teaches it, it's i guess you'd say the skills are transferable to other to other activities right learning responsible uh handling and storage and all that is is really transferable to other activities and if you can remove that intimidation factor and demystify it uh, everyone will be better off well, Joe, I sure appreciate you sharing this um, important initiative with us in the month of June. And then I want to thank NSSF for kind of putting a spotlight on firearm safety in the month of June. Um, it's really, it's an important um, aspect of firearms ownership year round, um, day to day, uh, minute to minute. We have to be safe, responsible gun owners. And um, hopefully, you know, this podcast will shed some resources to individuals um, that will get out there, mentor someone, um, look up a Project Child Safe resource, perhaps um, pick up a new lock if they need one. Uh, whatever they need to do to harden their own household, if you will, um, to ensure that our firearms are kept, stored, and, and safe. Um, that's, that's really what you guys are doing with this. And I thank you so much. It's such an important thing as gun ownership is on the rise and as the reputation of firearms owners uh, continues to be um, bombarded, I would say, in the media in a very negative connotation, we really we, we have to be out there spreading good messaging, talking about how the firearms industry wants safe, responsible firearms owners, storage. We're providing those resources for safety, and we really are encouraging that next generation and current generation of, of gun owners and hunters to be as safe and responsible as possible. Possible. Yeah, thank you, Christy. I'm really proud to be able to to represent the industry in this fashion. Um, it's so often we talk about the business side. We're a trade association. We talk about business issues. We talk about legislation, you know, and in, in advocating in D.C. But to be able to talk about some of these safety initiatives, some of these mentoring programs, and the good that we're trying to do to help all gun owners and the industry and society at large. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about those type of things as well. So thank you for having me. Well, Joe, I hope that we can connect in person at SHOT Show one day. <laughs> Your crazy well, time of year, I'm point. sure. Uh, but yeah. I, I welcome that. And I encourage you, uh, you know, to keep doing everything you're doing. We just, the country as a whole would not be where we are without the NSSF and without the hard work that you're putting in to ensure um, that that our firearms traditions are are carried out into the next generation and we're protected, um, that we're safe and that we have programs in place to help, you know, that, that new person or like I said, established person to have more resources, to have a, a fun and safe shooting experience. So, um, and I want to thank everybody listening that has tuned into this episode. Um, and if you guys need anything, uh, go onto the NSSF website, which is the NSSF.org, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then is there any social media channels that our viewers and listeners should be following for NSSF? Well, we have we have several social media channels. Um, of course, Project Child Safe. We have one called Gun Owners Care, which is one that I'm 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 fond of because it it really highlights the charitable efforts that whether it be Hunters for the Hungry, whether it be our work with the Red Cross or our work with other groups around the country highlighting the good that gun owners do for their local communities, uh, fundraisers or, or other events. Um, so gun owners care, uh, hashtag gun owners care. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you to take a look at those, uh, those social media platforms because there's a lot of good going on that frankly gets underreported as, we, as we've discussed. And so we're trying to create that forum for people to share their positive stories, how they've impacted their local communities and others uh, in their areas. So um, 
but yeah, we have all, all the main, all the main uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. So please look us up on social media as well. Yeah. And we hope that all of our listeners and viewers get out there, enjoy a safe hunting season or trip to the range for many years to come. And that you all have uh, some incredible stories and lifelong memories uh, following those experiences. And thank you, Joe, for uh, providing some of those resources that are keeping everybody safe, educated and informed um, because after all, the firearms industry cares. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.